Hello and welcome back to another Python tutorial. So, good news for those of you who <clears throat> have been using the TD Ameritrade API. Um, it looks like there was an update, but when I was reading the documentation, it sounds like this content might have been there and I just maybe missed it. I'm still trying to figure that out. Anywho, they've made an update to their WebSocket streaming capabilities. So what we're going to be able to do is we're going to be able to create a script where we can basically create a connection to this streaming data API and we can have a constant flow of data coming towards us. So this might be things like prices, um, things like news headlines. So a lot of different types of data and it does appear that they're constantly updating it, at least from reading the documentation. Uh, nice thing is this will be great for people who are trying to get other types of data, things like Forex data, um, <clears throat> what is it? Futures data, um, level two market data, lots of good information is in the streaming uh, data API. However, like always, <laughs> the documentation is not the easiest to read. So it took me a little bit to kind of understand what was going on. And then I had to convert all the JavaScript code into Python code. So it will be pretty different than what we've seen in the previous ones, just because there is a portion that does actually have us request uh, an API component, but the second part of it, we're going to be working with entirely different libraries and we're going to have to go into some different types of detail when it comes to the Python component. So in this particular video, we're going to read through some of the documentation and we're going to basically get everything set up. So that way in the second video, we can go and make our, um, our API request to go get some information. So that way we can log in to the actual streaming data API. So bear with me in this first video, not a ton of code, but you do need to follow along or else you're gonna be completely lost <laughs> reading the documentation. Okay, so first things first, you do wanna make sure that you go to the developer website for TD Ameritrade. And you'll notice actually right here, they had an update one, it looks like it was July 18th. And if you click this link, it will take you to a new page and all sorts of good fun stuff. Basically, most of the stuff you don't need to worry about on this, but if you scroll down a little bit, and this is the part that was a little surprising to me, uh, they have a streamer API. For whatever reason, you cannot access the streamer API from the actual API's homepage, which was interesting to me. But if you go to this streaming data API, it basically tells you what kind of data you can have streamed to you. And they do give you this nice little kind of quick start guide uh, and how to get it all set up. Unfortunately, it is in JavaScript. So if you wanna do this in Python, we're gonna to have to now convert everything into Python. Now I've done all the heavy lifting and done that for everybody, but uh, just keep in mind, you're not gonna be seeing any Python examples on here. It's gonna be pretty much all JavaScript. Um, and so the top portion is how to get everything set up. And then they go into the actual endpoints and just how this particular uh, streaming data API works. And if you go down a little bit, <clears throat> you'll see some things like the introduction, how to log in, first steps, kind of important stuff. You, you should read through it. They talk about the different types of protocols you can use. So we can technically do HTTP requests. Um, they didn't recommend it though, from what it sounded like, but it seems like there is a capability. I am still going to have to read up on it. I'm not really sure how that works, but it does appear that we can possibly do regular API requests, but I'm going to have to look into it a little bit more. What we're going to be doing is WebSockets. So we're going to basically kind of be plugging into the streaming data API and have the data flow into us. So in our tutorials, we're going to be doing the WebSocket examples. Uh, and then if you keep going down, you're going to see some, some interesting stuff. So uh, a big important part of it is they give you an idea of what a request looks like. Obviously, it's going to depend on the endpoint that you're using, but generally they kind of break it into these main components where you have a service. So the service is the data that you're looking for. Um, we'll find that we can actually make multiple requests at once. So we have a mechanism that allows us to identify each one of our requests. And so we basically can go in there and say, hey, this is request zero, request one, and request two. And that's actually really important when it comes to doing things like logins and things along that. Uh, you will need to provide your account. You're going to need to provide your API key. Um, you're going to need to provide any parameters that are specific to that particular endpoint. So this obviously will change depending on the endpoint that you're using. 
um, but it's kind of nested in this basic request structure. Um, and then they have some commands. So this is things like, you know, do you want to log in? Do you want to log out? Do you want to subscribe to it? Do you want to unsubscribe to it? Do you want to stream? Lots of different things that you can do. Um, and we'll kind of go through that as time goes on. And then they give you an idea of what a basic response looks like coming back. So uh, if you have multiple requests, for example, you will see the service that was asked for, the request ID. So again, if you had two or three different types of requests, you'd say, oh, this is the data for request um, you know, two or something like that. The command that you use, a timestamp, timestamp's very useful, useful. We'll see how we're gonna leverage that in a database. And then the actual content of that particular request. So if there's data, there's data. If it's something like logging in, you basically just get this message back saying, hey, good job, you logged in. So good information. And then they have some heartbeat notification. This is just to say, hey, I'm pinging the server. We're still connected, right? You haven't disconnected me, right? Uh, that, that's really what that is. And then they give you an idea of what the, uh, the data looks like. So pretty interesting stuff. I think it's useful, uh, but definitely is a little bit overwhelming when you first start looking at it. They got some symbology tables. I, again, I haven't really looked too much detail into this. Um, they give you an idea of the service table. So this is kind of nice. This is where you can see, hey, we can now get Forex, futures, listed, NASDAQ, options, chart equity, chart futures, lots of good data here, lots and lots of good data here. Um, they do tell you hours available. So some of this data is not always available. Um, some is available 24 hours, but for example, like the NASDAQ stuff, oh, 7.30 to 8 p.m. So kind of just normal market hours and things like that. <clears throat> Response code tables, really good stuff. The one that we're going to really be concerned with in the beginning is logging in. Um, <clears throat> you have to log in before you can make any request. You can't make a request unless you're logged in to the streaming request. So this is going to be really the first important part before we get started. So um, at this point, I think you have at least hopefully a general idea of how to read the documentation. Uh, what we're going to do next is we're going to actually have to access a different endpoint to get the information we need to make this particular request. So we're going to make the login request, but in order to do that, we need to get some information from a different request. And that particular request that we're going to be using is a normal API endpoint. So if you go to APIs at the top of the web page and you go down a little bit, you'll see this one endpoint called user info and preferences. And I think at the top, if I remember correctly, they do tell you, yeah. So basically what they're going to tell you at the top is you do have to use that endpoint to get the information that you need, like I said, to make a login request. So uh, it's basically a two-step part. You use this endpoint and then you go and actually log in. And when you go to the user info and preferences and API, you're going to be using the get user principles. This particular endpoint does require an access token. So uh, in a, I think it was my first video, I showed everyone how to get an access token. I will not be covering that in this video. Um, I'm just going to be taking my old code and then leveraging that to get my access token. But you will need an access token to use this endpoint because it's going to be providing things like a streaming URL, account information, stuff that you want to you know, definitely keep private. Um, and then really, there's only one parameter that you have to pass through, it's fields, and that's basically the fields of data that you want back. And they, they give you a nice little example down here. I, I just used this one, and this gave me all the information I needed to um, make my login request. I mean, obviously, if you want, you can try it out here. You can set your credentials. Uh, you know, if you want, you can say, hey, I want to copy this little thing right here and, you know, put it in and oh, like that, and then you can set your access token, send a request, and you can see what it's going to look like coming back. So that's that's really the first component. So with that being said, I'm going to jump back into my Jupyter Notebook, and let's get started. All righty. So we're going to import a bunch of libraries. So the first one we're going to be doing is URL lib. Uh, this is going to be parsing for some information that we need in order to, um, what is it? Uh, get our access token and things like that. I'm not positive if I actually need this one in this particular code. I've kind of changed my code a little bit, so it might be in another module, but just to be safe, I'll import it. JSON, obviously, we're going to get some content backed. It's going to be in a JSON format. We need to convert it to a dictionary, so we're going to need to use JSON. And we're also having a problem where we, when we send requests, we have to send it as a JSON string. So that's the other component. 
The other one that we're going to be doing is request. This is for our API component. That should be pretty natural. And then, of course, we're going to have to parse some dates. So we're going to have to use a date parser in order to do that. So we'll just use the date utility parser. This is to basically take some information that comes back from the first API request and parse it so that way we can um, make sense out of it. That That's because it has to be in a certain format when you go and make that first login request. It's very picky, as I've learned. <laughs> okay, and then we're going to also need date time. This is going to be from, uh, what is it, uh, a function that we're going to def define. So we have to take our date time, and then we're going to have to convert it into milliseconds, which by default means we have to do some conversion. This will allow us to do that. Okay, and the fun part that people are probably naturally going to be a little bit confused on at first so I made a little Python uh, module code. This is basically taking <laughs> all the information that I use to go and get my access token and puts it into a nice little class object where I've just defined a couple of methods and uh, properties where I can just access this particular information. So again, I will be putting a link to the first video that explains how to get the access token, but I will not be running through all this code again. But all you need to know is that, hey, the first part is going to go and get that code that we need to make the second request to get our access token. So this was where we were using Splinter to interact with that forum and get all the information we needed. And then all it's going to do is give me back an access code that I can then use to make in the second part. So this is where I get my access token. The access token is what we need to make an authenticated request to do things like login and, and things like that nature. So uh, again, it's identical to what you were seeing in that first video, but um, I won't be going over this in this particular video. This is just helping me where I don't have to kind of code all that stuff over again. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to do TD Ameritrade stream uh, import <clears throat> uh, TD uh, authentication. Okay, and then there is some information that I need to pass through, and that's going to come from my config file. That is things like my account password, my account number, and then my client ID, so my access token. And then really, that's all I need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a new instance of my TD authentication client. So we'll call it TD authentication, and then it's going to take my client ID, it's going to take my account number and then it's going to take my password and then I'm going to call my TD client authenticate method authenticate and then this will go and authenticate my uh, account for me and then I'm going to grab the access token when all that stuff is done and so that will simply equal my client object and I have a nice little property called access token that I can just grab and that will return my access token to me. So, oh good, it worked the first time. Sometimes I get concerned a little bit to say the least. <clears throat> but basically all this is doing is it's now going out, it's opening the URL and things like that. I do have the splinter component set to headless so that way I don't see that, that user form. You can obviously change that if you want to. Um, do something like that. More than likely when I post the code to GitHub, I will be adding a component where, um, you know, I'll basically be putting down and below uh, all the code necessary in order to do it. So that way, you know, if people don't want to, you know, have to write their own little module or something like that, they can do it. But I'm assuming most people, if you've gotten to this point in the series, you probably know most of the stuff at that point. Okay, so we're going to have to define a new function. This is basically something I just found on Stack Overflow. It's going to really all it's going to do is it's just going to take um, a date time and it converts it into milliseconds. So it takes one parameter. We'll just call it date time. Um, we do need Epcot. So basically this is the time at time zero. Um, this will just help us to, um, what is it, calculate the information we need. So we have UTC from time stamp. And we're going to say, hey, start at point zero. And then all I want to return is the date time minus Epcot, and then I want the total seconds times a thousand. It will come back as a float, so we will have to convert it to integers. The um, login request does not allow 
for um, floats. Okay, so this, I would say, is a good point to stop. So if you have any questions at this point more regarding, I would say, the documentation or, or things like that, or more just getting set up to get the access token, please put them down in the comments below, and I will try to get back to you. Uh, next video, we're going to access the first endpoint to get the information we need to log in. So thanks again for watching, everybody. We'll see you in part two.